All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we, uh, we have a jam-packed Bible study ahead of us tonight. Uh, so just a, a recap. We are now in our seventh session uh, tonight in the book of Exodus. We've covered a lot of ground. In our last uh, lesson, Israel has, has, been, has escaped Egypt, essentially. And now they have been traveling from Egypt to Mount Sinai where God has told them to come and meet him. Uh, and, and he would give them further, uh, further instructions. So things have been tough. Remember last week, they, you know, they faced, uh, the Israelites faced water shortages, hunger, but through everything that, every challenge that they have faced, um, God has provided for them. They even were attacked by, the, uh, by Amalek. And uh, you know, they were attacked and had, to, and had their first taste of, of warfare. And, and God provided for them as well through the prayers of Moses who held out his hands um, kind of in the sign of the cross, like out, outstretched hands with a staff in his hands. They were able to be victorious. So God has provided for them, even though every step of the way they're, they're grumbling, they're saying how much they miss Egypt and how much, you know, why, why, did, they, why did you bring us out of Egypt, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, God has, God has really taken care of them and, and shown great love for his people. And now the Israelites are approaching their destination. So we are going to start in chapter 18 today. And we, I'm going to just quickly summarize the first part of chapter 18. So for, in verses 1 through 16, Moses uh, is reunited with his family, meaning his wife Zipporah and their two sons. So it, it presumably Moses sent them back to Midian. Um, when things were getting dangerous in Egypt, he, he sent them back to be with Jethro, Zipporah's father. And they've been with Jethro during this time, uh, while Moses has been leading the Israelites out of Egypt. So now in this first part of chapter 18, uh, Moses, or Jethro, along with Zipporah and their two sons, approach the camp. They send word to Moses that they're coming, and Moses receives them. And, and pays them, uh, pays Jethro honor and homage. So uh, J Moses tells him everything that has happened, you know, he gives all the details about how God has blessed them and preserved them for everything they've been through. And Jethro praises God and offers sacrifice to, to Yahweh, even though he's a Midianite, he's a foreigner. Um, and he offers the sacrifices through Aaron, the priest. So the next day, Jethro uh, he observes Moses sitting to judge the people. And what that means is that uh, Moses at that time was the only judge. And so when there was a quarrel or something between two people in the camp, they would go to Moses who would decide, you know, what to do. And Mo Moses is sitting, at, you know, with the people from morning until night, um, you know, listening, you know, listening to these different cases and trying to decide you know, what's going to be the best and try to find a resolution. And Jethro is watching this and we pick up in verse 17 of chapter 18. So chapter 18, verse 17, where we hear now Moses's father-in-law reply. So and this is now Jethro speaking in verse 17. What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions, and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So Moses, you know, may be blessed by God. He may be, you know, the lawgiver and, and he may speak face to face with God, but he's still a human being. And so Jethro sees what he's doing and the, the strain that he's having to put, the time and energy that he's having to put into judging all the cases of all the whole camp. And 
it's clear that Moses is not going to be able to do that forever. It's not a sustainable setup. He's not able to carry the burden of all the whole Israel on his shoulders. Uh, and Moses, to his credit, um, as we'll see in the next verse, he listens to Jethro and he establishes kind of this system of judges among the people. And you see that there's kind of different levels, you know, every 10 people, there's a judge, every 50 people, there's a judge. So there's like different levels. And then Moses is the supreme. He's kind of like the Supreme Court, so to speak. Um, St. Saint Augustine comments on this passage. He puts, he writes that uh, God spoke to Moses, did he not? Yet Moses very prudently and humbly yielded to the advice of his father-in-law, foreigner though he was, for he realized that from whatever intellect right counsel proceeded, it should be attributed not to him who conceived it, but the, to the one who is the truth, the immutable God. So what St. Augustine is saying is when there's good advice, when, there's, when someone shows good intellect, it comes from God, who is the truth, who is the truth. So Moses sees in his father-in-law this good advice, this wisdom, uh, you know, this wisdom that he has been uh, sharing with him, and he accepts it as coming from God himself. So uh, it's almost like Moses sees Jethro as someone coming from God to offer this advice to him to restructure the administration of, of the camp. So in verse 24, we continue. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves, then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. So Moses, or Zipporah and the two boys stay with Moses now, the re families reunited, and Jethro goes back to Midian. Uh, the administrative structure for the camp of the Israelites is starting to take shape now. Um, because Moses is discerning, shows good discernment here, and because he's humble, he accepts Jethro's good advice so that they can maintain peace within the camp. Um, and that's, that, that maintaining of that peace is important. They, right? they didn't come out of Egypt to you know, beat each other up in the desert. They have to be able to maintain peaceful coexistence in sometimes difficult circumstances, you know, wandering through the desert, being nomads is not an, is not an easy life. And as we'll see in the next chapter, they've been now have been on the road for over two months, almost three months. Uh, for me, I see this passage too as an important um, image of, of the of parish life, of the life of our churches, meaning our individual churches, individual parishes. You know, the burden of operating a functional, thriving, growing parish cannot fall on the shoulders of one person, whether that's the priest, whether that's a parish council member, the president, whether that's a pious, you know, steward who takes care of many of the needs of the community. It, it, it's not sustainable when, when our parishes are set up that way, when everything goes kind of through one person, even us or even a small group of people. The, a parish, just like, you know, the camp, and we'll see that our churches are set up very much like um, like, especially when we get to talking about the tabernacle, we'll see that how our churches imitate that. So we take, we still take a lot of our cues, you know, from the, even from this time, uh, you know, our, our churches have to be a collaboration. It has to be a, a combined effort of all the church members. Um, and we see, and what we, what you see in parishes when you do have very good participation among the stewards is that, when everybody gives of their time and their talent and their resources for the good of the church, then really good things can start happening. Uh, you really see a flourishing and, and a blossoming of, of that parish. And uh, recommended reading for more on this topic is uh, the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts, which follows immediately after the Gospel of John. We hear all about the early church and how, how they lived communally and, and supported the, you know, one another in the church and how the church spread like wildfire at that time. So. Uh, it's a good, something good for us to think about and, uh, and chew on as we, you know, continue our life in, in St. Constantine and Helen Parish. All right, and that brings us now to chapter 19. So on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. So three months, it's been three months since they left Egypt. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. 
Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Israel draws near to Mount Sinai. And uh, before anyone else approaches the mountain, Moses goes up and God speaks with Moses one on one. And he get, delivers this, this message here. Whenever you see mountains in the scriptures, nine times out of ten, mountains are intended to be a, a place of revelation a place of encounter with God, of, of a theophany, or of, of, of a revelation of God. And so that's no different here. Um, when you hear Mount Sinai, that they're approaching Mount Sinai, we should expect as listeners that God will be appearing at some point and speaking. And so we see the first, the first kind of exchange here between Moses and God. So God starts out his new covenant, which is what he's going to be doing here. He's going to be establishing covenant we'll talk more about that in a minute but he starts out by reminding them of what uh, he has already done for them as a sign of his might and authority but he also foreshadows what he will do in the new testament where jesus will crush the devil and bring out of bondage to sin and death uh, bring us out of bondage to sin and death and he will draw all mankind to himself so in the same way now that god speaks to moses and says you know, I'm the one, you, you saw what I did when I brought you out of Egypt. You know, there will come a time in the New Testament where the resurrected Christ will stand in front of Thomas and say, you know, see my hands and my feet, right? And look what I've done basically to, for you and for, every, for all mankind. And he'll draw all people to himself, um, just, like, uh, just like God is telling Moses here. So we have prefiguration. We're, there, there's going to be in this chapter, we're going to be talking about that a lot, about how Moses and this conversation with God and, and the commandments and these things prefigure many things in the New Testament. This is also an important um, foundation for what's going to come next, because we're going to get in these next chapters a lot of commandments, a lot of laws, uh, a lot of uh, guidance and, and the kind of uh, um, guidelines for life for the Israelites as we get into the promised land, as they get into the promised land. And in our modern day times, when we hear commandments, when we hear, uh, you know, God's law, things like that, the image that we get is, especially, um, I think the younger generations, the image that we have is, you know, of a, of a, uh, a God who arbitrarily decides these rules and who, you know, uh, practices and exhibits conditional love like if you do this then i will do this uh you know then i will love you um but god is reminding them here that he has already shown them that he loves them right god has already has already shown them very clearly that you know i brought you out of egypt i liberated you from slavery uh you know i, I fed you in the wilderness i brought you water out of the rock I purified the salty waters for you to drink. I gave you manna from heaven. I gave you quail in the evening. Um, you know, it's a, I brought you victory over Amalek in the wilderness when you were an untrained, you know, an unarmed army, basically. So God has already shown that he loves them, right? Like, that's not the point. You know, God doesn't need them to do anything for him to love them. You know, that's a, that should be assumed. But these commandments will be, and we use the word commandments, but... Um, you know, especially when we get to the Ten Commandments, the, the word that's used there is the Galogos, which is the ten words of the ten kind of messages there. Um, the, it, it, even more than just like a kind of like a, a arbitrary checklist of things for the Jews to do or for us as Christians to do, the things that God will present to them are part of a covenant. You know, they're part of a, um, they're part of an agreement. That's what covenant means is an agreement. And what the agreement is, is that if the Jews can uphold the things that God will say, then God, God's presence will stay with them. If they don't, then they, the covenant will be broken. And we'll see that eventually 
God's presence will leave the temple years later, many years later, and they'll be taken captive by Babylon into captivity. So that's like the ultimate sign of their, the breaking of this covenant is the, the Babylonian captivity and why it's such an important event in the history of Israel. I think as Christians, this is an important message for us too, right? That it's not that God needs us to do X, Y, and Z for us to love him. God loves us unconditionally, no matter what. But when we don't live a life according to the will of God, then we start to live a life according to our own will, according to our own desires and passions, which are broken and disfigured and, uh, you know, which are disordered. And we start to worship ourselves. And those things, those two things are incompatible. So when we turn, when we do that, we turn in towards ourselves and we turn away from God and we tell him to get away. And so God's presence will leave us out of respect for our decision to live the way that we want um, and to push him away. And so that's, that's to me, that's, the, that's a healthier way to talk about these passages, not just that God is establishing these random rules for them to follow. Um, so, so just something to keep in mind as, as we move forward. He's already shown them that he loves them. It's not, it's not like they need to do something to earn that. Uh, he's, God tells Moses here, you are to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this prefigures the church, the new Israel. So in the church, we are all citizens of the kingdom of God, a holy nation, right? We're baptized into that kingdom. Um, and we taste of that kingdom now. And we hope that through the grace of God and through our own humility, that we will one day enter into that kingdom in its fullness, um, when all the nations of the earth will be gone, and it will just be Christ and his kingdom, and that we'll be citizens of that kingdom. In the church, we are all called to stand before God and offer sacrifices, which is what the priest does. That's the role of the priest. We are all called to stand before God and offer the sacrifices of ourselves. Right? We offer ourselves to God. We are chosen, which is what the word clergyman means. Right? Cl clergy means, politicos means chosen, elected. So we've all been chosen by Christ to be part of this nation, to be part of this holy kingdom, and to do this in his church. So even within the church, every, Orthodox, every Christian, every baptized Christian is a priest in one sense, and that he has been chosen by God to serve a purpose in the world, which is uh, to offer ourselves and the world around us up to him in our prayers. Now, the priests within the church, there's obviously there's priests, which myself, um, they serve the role of administering the sacraments. So within the greater clergy of the church, you have this other smaller group of clergymen that do kind of the sacrament, especially the sacramental life of the parish as well. So I don't want to confuse anybody that like, you know, we're all priests in the sense that I'm a priest, but we are all priests in the sense that we're all baptized and uh, we're all part, chosen by God to serve a purpose within this church. So uh, now we're at verse uh, seven. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and said before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So God is offering and proposing a new covenant between him and Israel, and they agree. So in this covenant, uh, God will, God's presence will remain, will remain with them on the earth, unlike the other nations of the earth. They'll have a special role among the nations of the world, and they in return will follow this new way of life that God is going to give them, and they agree. And in the moment, they are very ready to commit and be obedient to God in all things. But we, this will not last. We'll just wait until we get to chapters uh, 32 through 34. In fact, as we said, the wickedness will get to so bad to, and their disobedience will be so bad that eventually God will leave them entirely and they will be taken captives to Babylon around the year 600 BC. Uh, we read in the writings of St. Paul, uh, Romans, book of Romans chapter two, verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So it's not enough to hear the law and say that you're going to do it. You have to do it. That's what justifies you. Um, this also highlights the reality of our own spiritual brokenness, right? I can, I mean, I can't even count how many times, right? You get that feeling where you're excited, you're committed in the spiritual life, you know, uh, 
you're starting something like, you know, you get to the start of Great Lent, you have the high point of the liturgical year in Pascha, you know, you have a really great confession and it energizes you, you know, it's, you, you feel committed, you feel like you're ready to really dive into your spiritual life and, and come to know Christ and to hold on to him tight. But as you move on from that experience, it gets more and more difficult because the feeling is gone, right? So the, the kind of that energized feeling, that sensation of, you know, wow, you know, you have this, this amazing um, you know, experience, eventually that it dissipates and then you have to make a conscious decision about what you're going to do with your life. Are you going to continue living the way that you've you know, committed to? Or are you going to go back to your old ways you know, and do things the way that you have always done them before? So the spiritual life is not about maintaining that feeling of your conversion, so to speak, right? Um, I heard someone once, not say for themselves, but they were, where there was a conversation that, oh, there was a person who said that when they come to church, they want to be impressed. They want to, you know, the, the music of the choir and the priest's voice and the sermon to like really like impress them, and shake them to the core. But that's not what the spiritual life is about. It's not about those moments where like you feel shaken up to do something. The spiritual life is about, you know, maintaining your commitment and living the life even when that those feelings are gone. Because the truth of the matter is that 99% of our lives are just the mundane, you know. It's just be in our house doing laundry and doing the dishes and getting dinner ready, going to work and driving in the car. So you're not going to, you know, God's not going to just reveal himself to you <laughs> while you're driving in the car, at least hopefully not, right? Probably end up crashing on the side of the road. But uh, most of the time, you know, that's, the, that's where the spiritual work happens. You know, that's where the spiritual progress happens. It's in the mundane. You know, it's in the, the um, and when you return to that quiet state um, that you have to really put the effort in and that's where you grow the most you know i can i compare it to you know like a, a marriage right newlywed couple you have the, the the high point of the wedding you're all energetic you're like ready to go you know you, you got you got all your new stuff from your wedding you move into the house together you know you're getting your house set up you know all these different things but at some point all that fun you know dissipates and you have to like actually do the work of being a married couple it's not easy. You have to continue it. But if you do the work, it's worth it. You know, it's, there's many blessings that come with it. And you see that you grow through that. You know, if we sit here and wait as a married couple to like always feel like we did on a wedding day, like we're going to be very disappointed. Like that's just not real. Um, it's the same thing, uh, you know, I'll compare it also to this, also to, you know, monks in the monastic life. There's a really nice documentary. It's about a monastery in, uh, I think it's in West Virginia. And it's, I think it's called Real Men. I believe is what it's called. And one of the monks, they're interviewing him and they, you know, he talks about this, about how when he first became a monk, he was like so excited and he was attending you know, all these services and he just like was so ready to be part of the monastic community. And it, he says, at some point that goes away and you have to decide, am I going to keep doing this? Am I going to keep my prayer rule going? Am I going to keep attending? You know, act, am I going to keep living this life? Because the, the happy feelings that energize you have gone away now. And now it's, now it's work. You know? Now it's real spiritual work. But he talks about that. And as soon as you make that commitment, then you, know, you can really, really grow and take off. So that's where the Israelites are now. The Israelites are they're, they're happy. They're amazed. They're shaken up everything they've seen now. So they're ready to commit. We'll see that they have a hard time moving forward. So in our own spiritual life, we can't, you know, wait for God to slap us on the face every day to, to do our prayers. You know, we have to, we have to expect that that's where the true growth will happen is when, you know, we're just in a quiet moment in our house and we turn to God and pray. Not to be, uh, you know, always have excitement in our lives. All right, so verse nine, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. 
Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Do not come near your wives. So God tells Moses how the people are to prepare to, for his arrival. Like God is now going to come and meet them on Mount Sinai. A uh, quick side note, so that he, God tells them that, you know, when they hear the horn, the ram's horn sound, then that, that's the time for them to approach. So the blast of the ram's horn was um, typical for how armies would uh, gather when they would call the soldiers together, they would blow the ram's horn and the soldiers would come to that point. Uh, so here we see God, God is preparing to summon his army, which is the nation of Israel. So the main point of this whole section here is that um, spiritual revelation, divine encounter, union with God requires serious preparation, right? The Israelites in this case are told what they need to do in order to be ready to meet God. And they need to wash their clothes. Uh, they need to abstain from sexual relations to avoid ritual impurity. And they need to avoid touching the mountain. God puts basically draws a line right around them. He says, you will not go inside this line. And anyone or any animal that goes in there is to be shot with arrows or stoned. Why? Because if somebody, you can't go and kill an animal by hand, and then you would be on the mountain too. And then you would be you would need to be executed as well. So God is setting very strict parameters about um, how and, you know, how and under what conditions they're going to approach him. So this raises the question of how we as Christians in the modern day prepare for divine interaction, for divine encounter, you know, and, our, and the main way that we experience that obviously is in the Eucharist, you know, when we come to church on Sunday and receive Holy Communion. Are we making ourselves ready? You know, do we pray in our homes the prayers of preparation to receive communion? Or do we fast if we're able? Do we fast during the week? Are we repenting of our sins? Are we turning to God, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Are we keeping ourselves pure in body, soul, and mind? You know, all of these things are something for us to consider, right? If the Israelites, when God comes down to meet them, are given all these special instructions for how they are to do so then i don't think you know then we as christians should not be cavalier to come to church and, and approach the chalice you know we have to not that we should not that we shouldn't do it but that we have to be serious about how we're how we're preparing you know we're not going over to the neighbor's house you know we're going we're going to meet the lord um and all of these things not only for us are, are to consider for ourselves and decide for ourselves what to do but really it's, the, it's best to be discussed with a spiritual father in the sacrament of confession and set these guidelines for yourself about how you are to prepare, especially to receive communion. So listen here to what St. Ambrose uh, wrote to priests about preparing to serve the, the Eucharist. So he writes, St. Ambrose, a fourth century uh, Italian bishop. If such regard was paid in what was only the figure, how much ought it to be shown in the reality? So in other words, if they had to do all this to meet God in the Old Testament, how much so, more so, and, and they're not even going to go to God. Moses is the one that's going to go. And how much more so are we, as he's speaking directly to the clergy here, but even to us as Christians, how much more should we show, um, you know, how much care should we show as we approach the Eucharist? Learn then, priest and Levite, what it means to wash your clothes. You must have a pure body wherewith to offer, offer up the sacraments. If the people were forbidden to approach their victim unless they washed their clothes, do you, while foul in heart and body, dare to make supplication for others? Do you dare to make an offering for them? So St. Ambrose, in writing to his clergy, is very clear, you know, that as, as, as the priests, you know, we need to be prepared. You know, we need to be maintaining uh, clean garments, so to speak, like the Israelites are here. And I would, you know, say speaking now to a group of parishioners, to people, faithful Christians in the church, that, that that responsibility also falls on the people. And now, obviously, we're not going to be perfect, right? We all have our sins, and we all have our, you know, mistakes. And 
Christ is merciful and we rely on that mercy to approach him too. Um, but we also need to do what we can, right? Like God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He knows our weaknesses, but he expects us to, to try as much as we can. So again, talk with your spiritual father and, and uh, go to confession and, and see what's the best path for you, is for your, especially for receiving communion. On a larger scale too, this kind of paints a picture of our whole spiritual life as our preparation for judgment day, right? Because when we die and go, you know, and we leave this life and go to be judged, you know, a lot of times we have this vision of like clouds and angels playing harps and things like that. When you die, your soul goes to the throne of God. You meet with God face to face. That's, that's one thing that we know. You go to be with God. So if we are to be meeting Christ, then our whole life, everything that we do, serves as a preparation for that meeting. You know, are we preparing ourselves for the moment of death, for the moment of our judgment before God? Are we living a life according to his will and commandments, according to the way that he has shown us? Or are we living the way that we want and making ourselves the lawgivers, making ourselves into gods and idols? Are we repentant and struggling against our sinfulness or do we reject virtue and embrace evil? Things for us to think about. Because essentially that's what God is telling the Israelites here is to be, to be clean, to approach, to approach God. There's a phrase on the holy mountain of Mount Athos um, in the monastic communities there, where it's uh, in Greek, it's Ean pethanis prin pethanis, then tha pethanis otan pethanis. In, in English, that's if you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. So in other words, to translate from English to normal person speak, if you are prepared for your death, right, by dying to sin in this life, then when you die and go to the next life, you will live eternally. Be ready for that meeting. So we have to view our whole life on this earth as a preparation to meet Christ on the day of our judgment. So that brings us now to verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So we remember in the beginning of the book how God shows himself to Moses, and it's, it's a bush on fire. It's a, the, the, the burning bush, which was obviously a miraculous occurrence, but it's nothing like what's happening here, right? Here, the whole mountain is on fire. You know, God comes down in fire, and it's just billowing smoke and there's this dense cloud over the top of it and it would have been very you know awesome in the term you know in, in the sense of awe-inspiring frightful right it would have been terrifying we'll see that later in this in this we'll see that the israelites are frightened and they tell moses that they're we don't want to talk to god anymore you can talk to god for us and tell you you, you can tell us what he has to say so now this is the third time that god has revealed himself uh, in a cloud so you remember at the red sea he appears in the form of a cloud. Uh, and then in the wilderness, when they're in the wilderness complaining that they don't have water or food, I think, they, he appears again in a cloud. And now on Mount Sinai, here he is again, revealing himself in, the, in a cloud. So the cloud is symbolic of God's revelation. When you see clouds, that's, that's a symbol of God's presence. So this is not God's nature. God is not a cloud, right? But it's a sign of his presence in a way that's familiar to mankind. All right, verse 20, the Lord descended on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. So now you can imagine the mountain's on fire and God tells Moses to come up. So I'm sure Moses was thrilled, but Moses goes up. And the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. So God is maintaining the boundary, right? He's saying, go and tell the people that they are not to cross this line. You know, they are not to draw near to the mountain. So the church interprets um, this divine manifestation of God here on the mountain coming down in fire as a, a manifestation of God, the son, a pre-incarnate word who eventually will be incarnate in the flesh and the person of Jesus Christ. So in the life of Christ, the people will claim 
we talked about this when we discussed the gospel of John, that people will claim to Christ, they follow Moses, but they don't know where Jesus comes from, right? They say, well, we can't follow you. We don't know where you're from. We follow Moses. Yet here, here is the logos, the word, speaking with Moses on the mountain, on Mount Sinai. So Moses' mission is to direct people to God, not to himself. And their zeal, though, for the law of God, you know, maybe, maybe mistakenly sometimes referred to as the law of Moses, they completely miss the point and they attach themselves to Moses. So Moses is speaking and writing about Christ, and yet they're, they're attaching themselves to him. So anyone who claims to follow Moses should, by extension, follow Christ. Because here we see them speaking together. And obviously Christ is not in the same form as he is in the New Testament. But, you know, um, that's where, that's what basically, essentially what Jesus tells them is, you can't follow Moses and not follow me because Moses followed me, essentially. Uh, which we, we talked about in the Gospel of John as well. All right, verse 23. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So Moses and Aaron are the only ones that can go up the mountain. Anyone else, if they approach, they will die. You know, they, they will be destroyed by just by God's presence, right? I mean, we... we um, We'll even see this later when Moses asks to see God's face. He says, well, you can't see my face because if you do, you'll die. So God warns the people that they all have to stay back. Moses and Aaron being consecrated as God's messengers, they're able to go up. And that brings us now to chapter 20. The chapter where we get the most probably, if not the most, one of the most famous and well-known passages of scripture, the Ten Commandments. So in Exodus chapter 20, we start out in verse one, and God spoke all these words. So the word there is not commandments, it's words, right? All these messages. God gave them these messages. So again, we cannot take them as our arbitrary rules, right? God's not playing board games with the Israelites, right? They're not opening up the Monopoly box and reading the rules for the Monopoly, right? Do not pass, go, do not collect $100, right? That's not what's going on here. God is establishing them and giving them the messages for how to live the best life how to live the uh, pure and holy and righteous life as human beings. And that is what will keep them attached to God, will keep God's presence because they will not turn towards themselves and they will not push God away in that case. So keep that in mind as we're talking about the 10 commandments, because we talked about them as commandments, you know, like, oh, you have to do this, otherwise I won't love you. That's not, what we're, that's not what's going on here. So uh, here, let's start out in chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. First, first one. That's the first one. You shall not make for yourselves yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God begins the Ten Commandments with a simple statement, I am the Lord your God. The justification then for all these ways of life, right, that God is about to give them, the, the basis of that is that they come from the one true God, who has not only created heaven and earth and everything in them, but has brought them out of Egypt with his power, has sustained them in the wilderness and has now brought them and is now speaking to them face to face. The statement, I am the Lord your God, is the foundational truth of the law of God through Moses. And the law then directs the Israelites back to this simple truth. They don't do these things just because, you know, they're not, they should not, they're not, they should not be looked at as an end in themselves. Like that's the reason to live is to follow the commandments. We follow the commandments. Even in the church, we follow the rules of the church because it brings us back to this reality of who God is. It reveals to us who God is and reminds us of everything that he's done for us in our lives. So in subsequent books too, in the Torah, God will repeat this phrase again and again and again. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. He keeps saying it over and over again. 
Uh, and we'll, and why does he do that? Because they keep worshiping other gods. So he has to keep reminding them, like they're not their gods. They're not the real gods, right? They're not, these other gods are, they're nothing compared to me. I'm the one who did it, all these things. The most basic way to honor this truth of God being the one true God, I'm the Lord your God, is to worship the one true God alone and not make any idols or honor any other gods. So this will be the stumbling block of Israel throughout their, all their ancient history. There was, it was funny. There was, a, there was like an article. Every once in a while, you get like Bible history articles. We're basically trying to say like, like this article was like, oh, in these ancient Hebrew homes, they found like idols. They found like statues to other local gods. And they were trying to make the point that like the Israelites weren't monotheists and things like that. But if you read the scripture, really, you're like, well, yeah, duh. That's what, that's what God's been fighting with them all this throughout all these books in the New Testament, oh, Old Testament. He's like fighting with them basically because they keep worshiping other gods. So like we shouldn't be surprised you know, <laughs> when archaeology discovers idols in the homes of the ancient Hebrews. We should say, well, yeah, that's what the scripture tells us too, that they weren't, they weren't, on, they weren't honest to God. They were not committed to him. They were worshiping other gods as well. And even in the Old Testament book, like in the prophets, like Hosea, God compares, you know, God tells Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. And he compares Israelites. They basically, he says, well, this is my experience. I, I married myself to Israel and they go and they, they connect themselves to all these other gods like me. So uh, it's, it's something that it's, this, it's God puts it first. He'll remind them again and again, because it's something that they will struggle with throughout their entire history. So at the time that this is taking place, too, we have to remember that the vast majority of the ancient world are pagans, meaning they worship statues uh, and other sacred sites of like many, many deities, right? I think the ancient Greeks, the pantheon of ancient Greece and Rome, the Babylonians, you know, Eastern religions, things like that. So besides in, in today's society, though, besides for a few like Eastern religions and, you know, like Wicca um, and there's probably others I'm not aware of. You know, this is not our modern day real, you know, reality. There's not people like worshiping, you know, idols for the most part in their homes. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, paganism and idol worship doesn't happen today in the modern day. It doesn't mean that we ourselves don't struggle with idolatry. What is an idol? An idol is anything that we place in God's place. It's anything that we take and put in God's seat, so to speak. So anything in our life, um, can become an idol. You know, it could be our careers, right? If we prioritize our careers over God, it could be our wealth. It could be our physical uh, bodies, right? We were, you know, we worship our bodies in, in different ways. Uh, it could be sports and entertainment. It could be our academics if we're students. It could be even our families, right? If we, if we worship our families above God, then we are doing a disservice to our families even. Um, it could be anything, you know, it could be anything in our life that takes part of our heart away from God. Um, and if we place that our, if we place on that thing in our life more importance and priority than God, then we've made it into an idol. And we're breaking this first couple of commandments here. So we need to be vigilant uh, in our lives and really be careful about the different elements of our lives and as modern people we have so many things going on um but we need to be vigilant and not allow anything to take a place in our heart away from god um, because that's what god wants god wants our hearts he wants um to have us place within us to dwell and to, to live and to give us life but if we take that spot and give it to something else then we're then we're worshiping we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping that thing. Um, so we have to be, we have to be careful, you know, in our lives. And that, that goes for everybody. And sometimes those things are not bad in themselves, but they can make, we can make them into idols, you know, inadvertently. All right, verse seven, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Usually that one, you should not take the, the name of the Lord in vain. So the unspoken truth here. In this, in this commandment, is that the name of God is sacred. Sacred means, at least the way that I see it, sacred means that there are restrictions on when, where, and how we use something, 
right? Think about things in the church. You know, we don't take the, I know as a priest, I don't take the chalice home and put it out at the dinner table to drink a glass of wine at dinner. And we don't put, take the altar cloths and use them as a picnic blanket. You know, we're not using the icons, hopefully at least, to design like t-shirts, you know, or, or it's decorations in our homes. We don't go in the church and play football. You know, these, these things, these places are sacred and holy. And they're, they're meant to be used only for certain reasons at certain times. So the name of the Lord is no different. We are not to use it indiscriminately, you know, just willy-nilly. But we are to use it, uh, but we are to use it in a positive way as a spiritual weapon against the evil one. So that's why as Orthodox Christians, we have the practice of saying the Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. So in that prayer, we use the name of the Lord, right? Lord Jesus Christ. But this prayer um, is not using the name of the Lord in vain, but it purifies the soul. It breaks up the hardness of our hearts, looking at you, Pharaoh, um, so that the virtues can take root in us and so that we can draw near to God. Furthermore, the name of Jesus strikes down our spiritual enemy, the devil. Um, I believe it was St. Ephraim of Katanakia. I'll have to look. And St. Ephraim is a new saint of our church. He told one of his disciples that even when um, we don't feel the effects of the Jesus prayer, it burns the devil continuously and drives him away from us. So let's always use the Lord's name, but in the right way. You know, let us use it in prayer, especially in the, the Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart. All right, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So Christ fulfills the Sabbath once and for all, when he, after being crucified, he rests in the tomb on the Passover Sabbath. So we have this beautiful image of Christ fulfilling the Sabbath by literally being laid in a tomb and staying there throughout that day. And then, of course, the next morning, early in the morning before the sun rises, he rises from the dead and um, establishes a new day of the Lord, right? It's no longer the Sabbath. It's no longer Saturday. That's the day of the Lord. It's Sunday, which in Greek is Kyriaki, which literally means the day of the Lord in honor of his resurrection. So that's why as Christians, we don't keep the Sabbath restrictions. We don't celebrate Sabbath and honor the Sabbath because now we have the Lord's day. So we are called to, you know, we are called to, to honor the Lord's day by attending church, by not working, God willing. Um, and even uh, there's a, even in like the old country, you know, like women won't do like laundry on Sunday. You know, they like won't do menial tasks or or like on feast days, they will not you know, they'll abstain from working because it's the day of the Lord. So that has been transferred from the Sabbath to the day of the Lord, Sunday. Verse 12, all you parents out here will love this one. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So this is, out of all the commandments, this is the only positively framed one. All of them are like, don't, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, you shall not, you shall not. But this is a do, honor your father and mother, positive. Uh, furthermore, it comes with a promise uh, that if you do it, if you honor your father and mother, that you will receive the promise of long life and blessings in the promised land. St. Ambrose writes, uh, honor your father that he may bless you. Even if the father is poor and does not have plenty of resources to leave to his sons, still he has the heritage of his final blessing with which he may bestow the wealth of sanctification on his descendants. So in other words, the blessing of a parent to a child, especially as the parent is dying, is of a great importance. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heritage. It's an it's a inheritance for that child. And he finishes by saying it is a far greater thing to be blessed than it is to be rich. So don't just honor your parents because they have money to give you when they pass away, but so that you can have their blessing. Uh, and that blessing can be extended even into the kingdom of God. I like to think too about this as like children honoring their parents is like a training ground for them honoring God as adults, right? Like for, uh, for kids, their parents kind of stand in God's place. You know, they're kind of like the gods of the house. You know, there's nothing that mom and dad can't do, especially for small children. 
So when children are learn as, as young children to honor their father and mother, then when they become adults, if they're raised faithfully, um, it's much easier for them than to honor God in their life as well. And when we honor God, we are blessed eternally. So uh, verse 13, now we'll just kind of uh, shoot through the rest of these. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So these final commandments don't get much explanation or commentary or further, you know, further bullet points here because they're pretty self-explanatory. You know, these are kind of like minimum baseline for behavior, not killing or committing adultery or theft. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't add any uh, commentary on those because it kind of should really go without saying. All right, a few, um, few bonus thoughts here on the commandments. So the 10 commandments, uh, as we know them, although they're very important and they definitely start the conversation, they are not the whole of the Mosaic law. So as we'll see in the upcoming weeks, there are many, many laws that God gives the Israelites, many, many. Um, so this list is not in any way exhaustive or by any means for us to say, well, as long as I do these 10 things, then I'm living righteously. It wasn't that way for the, for the Israelites, and it's not that way for us either. Christ sh further shows this in the New Testament when asked what the most important commandment is. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So the law is a way of life beyond even the 10 commandments to keep people close to God, um, to keep them free. Furthermore, Christ in the new Testament will fulfill, expand and add to these. So a great example of this is the sermon on the Mount in the gospel of Matthew, um, which even in its setup is very similar to what's happening here, right? Moses on a mountain talking with God, New Testament, you know, in Matthew, Christ is on a mountain talking to his disciples, delivering this kind of new law to his people. So instead of the Ten Commandments, he starts by preaching the Beatitudes, which are kind of the new standards of blessedness in this kingdom that he's ushering in. So I'll read them quickly here. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Uh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who, went, who were before you. So similar to how God starts Moses here with the 10, 10 messages, the, the Decalogue, the 10 commandments, Jesus starts out with the Beatitudes, and then he keeps going. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually takes a few of the 10 commandments, and he like expands on them and takes them to the next level, which is the level of the heart. It's not just about bodily purity, that it's about spiritual purity. So in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, he says, you have heard it was said of those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Where is that? It's in the 10 commandments. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. P.S. Without a cause is not in the original Greek. So really, it's if you, if you have anger in your heart, then you are in danger of judgment. So Christ even takes it to the next level, the level of the heart. One more example here, Matthew 5, 27 to 28. You have heard it said uh, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Where do we hear that? Ten Commandments. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So all this is to say that, the, that though the Ten Commandments are super important and holy and very good to follow as Christians, uh, we follow also the law of the kingdom of God as given to us by the Lord and are called to live our lives the way he has guided us so that we can be united to him. So these are just like a starting point. You know, that's, there's, there's many, many, many more things that we are called to do. All right, let's, let's run through the rest of this chapter really quick. I know we're at eight o'clock, so forgive me. All right, verse 18, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, 
They trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. So there you go. There's the fear of the Israelites seeing this mountain on fire and hearing the voice of God. So the, the magnitude of the revelation is just too much for them. So they ask God not to speak to them directly anymore, <laughs> just through Moses. But this is the beginning of the prophetic tradition, you know, that God will speak through prophets, you know, even, you know, in the time of the kings, all the way to John the Baptist, that, that God will speak through prophets to the people. Uh, it's a good lesson for us that it's a fearful thing to come into the presence of, of the living God. All right, verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. So the nature of God is a deep mystery, which is why you see here this very thick cloud, darkness. We can never know God in his essence because he's completely transcendent. He's completely other, you know, otherness than we are. We can only know God through revelation what God chooses to show us. And the greatest revelation that we've ever received, obviously, is Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate God who shows to us the image of the Father. Here, God humbly allows Moses to approach him and speak with him. So this, again, is a prefiguration of Christ. Christ will sanctify the whole created world through the spilling of his blood on the cross. Why? So that we can draw near to him and receive the life-giving grace of God for ourselves from him. Just like Moses has been sanctified to approach, we will be sanctified through the blood of Christ, through the revelation of God in Christ and the spilling of his blood, so that we can draw near. And we see this play out also in our spiritual life. When we engage in the life of the church, when we engage in our personal spiritual struggle and exert that spiritual effort, we can approach God and even be united to God. And this is what we see in the lives of the saints, of course. This is a lifelong effort and will require constant vigilance and persistence. All right, and then we just have a few more verses here. Verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. So God, God is even here after giving the commandments, he's reminding them again not to make, make uh, idols. Verse 24, make an altar of earth for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, meaning cut, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps or your nakedness will be revealed. So God tells them to worship him with altars and sacrifices, and he gives them a few regulations, which we'll see there will be many, many, many more as we get into not only the rest of this book, but books, the next few books as well. So that brings us to the end of chapter 20, and we're four minutes over, so I super apologize. All right, are there any questions? Any, uh, any uh, comments, concerns, anything anybody wants to share? I know there was a lot. There's a lot in that chapter. I was preparing today and I was like, oh, this is a doozy. <laughs> so I appreciate your patience. All right. Thank you, everybody. So we, God willing, will meet again for Bible study uh, next Tuesday. Uh, let's all pray tonight that uh, the storm's not that bad so I can get to church tomorrow for Papandi and celebrate the liturgy and, and uh, commemorate everybody. So uh, thank you all. God bless. And um, we'll see you all, God willing, next Tuesday for Bible study. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Father. Much. Thank you.